the speed control system has been an increasingly popular option on some car and truck models. And since you're going to be seeing and servicing more of these units from now on, this seems to be a good time to explain what goes on inside this speed control unit. As a matter of fact, I'll be asking the questions today because there are some things that haven't been explained to me as yet. Joe should be able to supply all of the answers. He's the expert around here on speed control. Although this servo is serviced only as a complete assembly, understanding how it works will help you diagnose and correct any problems that may develop. As you probably know, the system consists of the driver's controls built into the turn signal lever, the servo assembly, the drive cable, a throttle control cable, and a brake release switch built into the stoplight switch. Next, let's see how these parts are related to each other. The servo unit is connected by a speedometer cable to the speedometer drive at the transmission. This provides the system with the speed signal it needs to make the servo unit react to changes in vehicle speed. A vacuum hose connects the servo to manifold vacuum at the power brake booster. Intake manifold vacuum supplies the system with the power required to operate the carburetor throttle when more power is called for to maintain vehicle speed. A flexible cable connects the servo to the carburetor throttle linkage. This completes the mechanical hookup between the servo unit and the engine. The combination speed control and turn signal lever contains the electric switches the driver needs to operate the system. The control ring has on, off, and resume positions. The speed set button locks the system in at the speed selected. A combination stoplight and brake release switch is connected to one of the solenoids in the servo. The brake release switch deactivates the speed control system when the driver pushes on the brake pedal. That's a good orientation to the parts the mechanic can see. But I'm sure that a lot of the fellas would like to hear an explanation of what goes on inside the servo. That's next on the program, Tech. When intake manifold vacuum is applied to the servo diaphragm, it pulls on the cable connected to the carburetor throttle. That's how engine vacuum supplies the force needed to open the throttle and maintain car speed. Next, we need something to control the amount of vacuum pulling on the diaphragm so that the throttle won't be advanced when it should be retarded. Vacuum is controlled by an air bleed, a vacuum control valve, and an intake manifold vacuum port. Here, the valve is shutting off the air bleed so that manifold vacuum is exerting maximum pull on the diaphragm. This provides the increased engine power needed to maintain car speed on a hill. In this position, the air bleed is open. The valve has moved over and the manifold vacuum is shut off. Since the vacuum has been dumped, there is no pull on the diaphragm and the throttle return spring closes the throttle. On level road, the valve modulates vacuum. That is, it is positioned between the air bleed and the manifold vacuum port. If a little more power is needed to maintain speed, the valve is moved closer to the air bleed. The valve moves closer to the vacuum port to prevent overspeeding. And now for the $64 question. What controls the possession of the vacuum valve? Car speed and a flyweight governor, Tech. But uh, I'd better explain how that works in easy steps, starting with the governor. The governor is driven by the drive cable. As the flyweights are turned faster, centrifugal force moves them outward, okay? I'm right with you, Joe. As car speed increases and the flyweights move outward, a follower at the center of the governor is pushed outward, to the right in this simplified illustration. Now all we need is a way of connecting the governor to the vacuum control valve so that car speed will determine the valve's position. The governor follower pushes on the core of an electromagnetic locking coil. This core extends through the vacuum control valve, but is not attached to it, at least not yet. The other end of the core pushes against a governor spring, so the core is balanced between the push of the governor and the resistance of the spring. I get it. For every car speed, 
the governor pushes the core through the locking coil and into a definite speed position. But how is the core connected to the vacuum control valve? By a locking armature, Tech. The armature is connected to the control valve by a pivot device. In this illustration, the locking coil is not energized, so the armature is in the released position. Now notice, the air bleed is open and the valve is shutting off the vacuum port. There is no vacuum pull on the diaphragm, so car speed is controlled by the accelerator pedal, not the speed control system. Here, the locking coil has been energized and the coil's magnetic field has pulled the armature down against the core. In this position, the core and valve are locked together. The system is now locked in to the speed selected by the driver. The valve has been moved into the modulating position between the air bleed and vacuum port. Since the core and valve are locked together, the governor now controls the valve position to maintain the speed selected. If the car slows down, the governor will back off and let the governor's spring push the core, armature, and vacuum valve to the left ever so slightly. As a result, the valve will be moved against or much closer to the air bleed and away from the vacuum port. This will result in more vacuum pull on the diaphragm and the throttle will be opened enough to maintain the speed selected by the driver. Now that would be the uphill position of the valve. If the car starts to overspeed on a downgrade, the governor will push the valve away from the air bleed and against the vacuum port. As a result, there will be little or no pull on the diaphragm, so the throttle return spring tries to close the throttle. Now, can you explain how stepping on the brakes deactivates the speed control? Sure thing, Tech. I'll start by explaining what happens inside the servo. A solenoid-operated brake release valve is built into the vacuum chamber of the servo. This spring-loaded valve is normally open. In the released position, the spring holds the valve up so that it uncovers a large air bleed port. With this port open, manifold vacuum cannot pull on the diaphragm and hold the throttle open. When the brake valve holding coil is energized, the valve closes off the air bleed port. That port must be closed before the system can take over to control car speed. Now notice, there are two feed connections to the holding coil. One feed goes directly to the coil. The other is connected through a set of holding coil contacts. These contacts are closed by energizing the holding coil and closing the brake release valve. Once they are closed, they provide the holding circuit that keeps the holding coil energized and the brake release valve closed. The brake release switch built into the stoplight switch is connected in series with the holding coil contacts and the holding coil. The brake release switch is closed when the brake pedal is in the released position. Stepping on the brakes opens the brake release switch. This opens the circuit to the brake holding coil and the spring opens the holding coil contacts and the brake release valve. Vacuum is dumped and there is no pull on the diaphragm or throttle cable. I can see how that works, Joe. Now, how about explaining the speed control ring and the speed set switches and circuits? Okay, Tech. Turning the speed control ring to the on position completes a circuit to the armature locking coil and another to the holding coil contacts. However, since these contacts are open, there is no feed to the holding coil. Momentarily pushing the speed set button in interrupts the circuit to the locking coil. This causes the armature to release the core so that the governor can push it into the correct position for the speed selected. At the same time, pushing the speed set button in also completes a circuit which energizes the holding coil. This closes the holding coil contacts and also closes the brake release valve. When the speed set button is released, the circuit to the holding coil is interrupted, but the closed holding coil contacts keep the holding coil energized and the brake release valve closed. At the same time, when the button is released, the locking coil is again energized and the armature locks in. 
the core and vacuum valve are locked together at the speed selected. I have another question. However, my question and Joe's answer is on the other side of the record. So please turn it for us. Can you explain what keeps the system from locking in at low speeds? Sure thing, Tech. The ground for the brake release valve holding coil is through a ground switch that's built into the servo and controlled by the governor. It actually fits in between the governor follower and the core of the locking coil. This ground switch remains open until the vehicle is moving about 30 miles an hour. At this speed, the governor closes the switch, completing the ground circuit for the brake holding coil. Actually, this is a snap action switch. It snaps closed at about 30 miles an hour. However, the opening speed for this switch is several miles an hour slower than that. In other words, the lock-in speed is higher than the lock-out speed. This feature ensures smoother speed control in the 30 mile an hour range. The resume speed feature lets the driver order the control unit to take the car back up to the previously selected car speed after he has stepped on the brakes. Is that what they mean when they talk about speed memory? Exactly, Tech. When the armature is locked to the core, a definite control speed is established. And as long as the control ring is in the on position, the armature will remain locked to the core. This is the memory feature. Now, applying the brakes opens the circuit to the brake release valve holding coil. The valve opens, this dumps the vacuum from the vacuum chamber, and the car slows down. However, stepping on the brakes does not affect the locking coil circuit in any way, so the armature remains locked to the core. The core stays put and remembers the speed selected. Turning the control ring to the resume position completes a circuit to the holding coil. This circuit energizes the holding coil closing the holding coil contacts and the brake release valve. When the resume ring is released, the direct circuit to the holding coil is interrupted. However, the circuit through the brake release switch and holding contacts keeps the holding coil energized and the brake release valve closed. I get it. With a brake air bleed closed, manifold vacuum takes over and advances the throttle so that the car accelerates to the previously selected speed. When it gets there, it remembers what that speed is supposed to be. Exactly right, Tech. I've worked up separate diagrams to illustrate different circuit conditions. This one shows which switches are closed and the circuits that are hot when the control ring is turned to the on position. This schematic illustrates the active circuits when the car is traveling more than 30 miles an hour and the speed set button has been pushed and then released. This last one shows what the resume circuit does. I didn't make separate diagrams for the low speed cutout or brake release switches because it's easy to figure out when and how these switches work. We'll just borrow these diagrams and put them in this month's reference book. That'll make it easy for everyone to study the circuits. Now, what words of wisdom do you have on service adjustment? There are only three service adjustments, Tech. This screw adjusts the accuracy of the lock-in speed. If the system doesn't lock in at the speed selected within two or three miles an hour, you may have to check this adjustment. Here's an important warning. These two very tiny screws are used in production to calibrate the low speed switch. They are sealed after they are properly calibrated. In other words, keep your cotton picking hands off them screws. What are the other service adjustments? The speed control cable for one tech. At curb idle, there should be 1 16th free play between the cable eye and the carburetor throttle lever pin. Lack of free play will keep the throttle from returning to idle. Too much free play causes inaccurate lock-in and erratic speed control. The third adjustment is at the combination stop light and brake release switch. It must be positioned so that less than one half inch of brake pedal movement will turn the control system off. You'll find all the adjustment and circuit troubleshooting information you need 
in the service manuals. However, I'm sure that understanding how the system works will make this manual information even easier to use. We'll put those three adjustments in the reference book along with your circuit diagrams, Joe. In the time that's left, how about filling us in on concealed headlights, how they work, diagnosis and service adjustments? Gladly, Tech. Actually, the service manual coverage on diagnosis and service is quite complete and easy enough to follow. However, a good working knowledge of the motor, the limit switches and the electrical circuits is very helpful to any mechanic who has to service a car with concealed headlamps. As you know, a single electric motor provides the power to open and close both doors. The motor is mechanically connected to the hinged headlamp doors by a rectangular torsion bar. The series wound motor has two separate field windings. Armature rotation is clockwise when current is fed through one of the windings, counterclockwise when the other winding is energized. Now inside the motor, a worm gear on the end of the armature shaft drives a large pinion gear. The torsion bar extends through the rectangular opening in the hub of the pinion gear. That red plastic piece is the limit switch actuating cam. The switch plate is also the cover for the gear case. When the switch plate is in place, the cam is centered between the two limit switches. They are part of the switch plate. One is the door closing limit switch, the other the door opening limit switch. When the ignition is on and the headlights are turned off, the motor closes the headlight doors. The circuit is through the door closing switch. When the doors reach the fully closed position, the red cam opens the door closing limit switch. This cuts off the feed to the motor and it stops with the doors in the closed position. When the lights are turned on again, the motor turns in the opposite direction to open the doors. The circuit is through the door opening limit switch. When the doors reach the fully open position, the cam opens the door opening limit switch and this stops the motor. Can you explain the circuit details for us, Joe? I was just getting to that, Tech. The electrical units involved are the headlight switch, the ignition switch, a circuit breaker, a relay, and the motor. Now, I'll hook these up schematically and follow the door closing circuit. This represents the circuit when the ignition is on and the headlights have been turned off. The circuit is from the ignition switch through the circuit breaker to the relay. At the relay, the circuit branches. One branch goes through the relay operating coil and to ground at the headlights. However, the resistance of the relay coil is very high, so there isn't enough current flow in this circuit to light the headlights, just enough to energize the relay coil. The energized relay coil completes the circuit through the door close contacts of the relay. This circuit feeds the door closing limit switch at the motor. As we pointed out before, this feeds the field that causes the doors to close. When the doors reach the fully closed position, the cam opens the closing limit switch and the motor stops, right? Right on, Tech. At the same time, the opening limit switch closes. However, the circuit leading to this switch is already open, so nothing happens until the lights are turned on. Turning the headlights on completes a circuit through the headlight switch to the upper end of the relay coil. Since both ends of the relay coil are now connected to battery positive, there is no current flow through the coil and it is no longer energized. A spring pulls the relay contacts downward, completing a circuit through the door open contacts of the relay that feeds the opening limit switch at the motor. Since the door opening limit switch is now closed, the other field winding is energized and the motor runs in the opposite direction to open the headlight doors. When fully open, the cam opens the door opening limit switch. Of course, the headlights are on because there is a direct circuit from the headlight switch to the headlights. That bit about opening switches being closed and closing switches opening may have gone a bit fast for some of us, Joe but we'll put it all in the reference book so everyone can study the switches and circuits at their leisure. Now, 
What service tips can we put in the reference book? You can tell mechanics about these new headlight door stops. They really do a job of eliminating most of the noise associated with the opening and closing of concealed headlight doors. You should also make sure everyone understands that there are four different limit switch actuating cams. They are different colors, and it's important to know which color goes with each car model. We'll put all of Joe's tips and suggestions in the reference book. We'll also explain the reasons behind the service precautions and warnings in the service manual. I'm sure everyone will find all of this information both educational and useful. Thank you.